can't quite reach all those BDU, shirt, jacket, or tunic pockets underneath your body armor, vest, or load-bearing equipment? Sick and tired of retaining all that heat and sweat around your back, chest, and stomach? Wondering why even have them for that matter, as they're hard to reach and even harder to gain access to because of their angle and locations? Well, it sounds like you need yourself a new state-of-the-art combat shirt. But before you pick one up, you may be wondering, gee, how did these come to be? Well, though it sounds pretty straightforward, the story is actually a bit more extensive and even incorporates another element of gear, or rather modification, the raid mod. So prepare for another sort of two-for-one history video. Since the mid to late 2000s, you may have noticed an increase in troops wearing long sleeve shirts that seem to blend a t-shirt with a more traditional combat top, such as a battle dress uniform, tunic, or jacket, which frequently sees the torso section mostly featureless and being comprised of thinner and lighter fabric, while the sleeves boast more pronounced solid colors or camouflage patterns in a thicker material, often seeing a variety of elements such as pockets, reinforced areas or slots for padding, adjusters, and so on. Seen around the world, this particular garment is now embedded into many armed forces as well as available to the public through a number of manufacturers. Often these pieces have a list of different names and official designations, but for the most part can all be lumped under the simple and efficient name of combat shirt. Making a big splash a few years into the global war on terror, these shirts actually have roots as far back as the Second World War and are connected to quite a number of custom-made uniforms spanning the time between, with the most significant being a series of specific pieces identified by the General name of Raid Mod. But in order to properly cover it, we must first travel back in time, as well as into Europe, with U.S. Army paratroopers. It's June of 1944 and the Allies are preparing the largest invasion force in history, Operation Overlord. With many different elements and units participating, a lot was going on. One of the earliest stages, though, was a nighttime airborne assault, which would help clear the way for the bulk of invasion forces arriving by boat the next morning along the Normandy coast. Realizing airborne infantry units were becoming a thing early on in the war, newly raised U.S. paratrooper units sought to customize and eventually standardize a specialty uniform vastly different than that of regular infantry, which had an emphasis on angled and larger pockets allowing for better access, especially when wearing webbing and strapping from parachutes and essentially everything else they'd be jumping with. If you want to learn all about that uniform, you can check out our full video on it. But for this tale, we need not look further than the small-scale customizations seen sporadically during the war. These modifications were not universal, but usually saw a variety of changes, reinforcements, or the moving of components, with the most obvious being the addition of large cargo pockets added to the sleeves, as certain soldiers felt that it was hard to access their equipment stored in the chest and waist pockets of the jacket. Though shoulder sleeves didn't become official until many decades later, the precedent was set and the practice would continue to be seen throughout the rest of the century during large-scale conflicts, with the next big one coming in the 1960s during the Vietnam War. Taking inspiration from the paratrooper uniforms, standard jungle fatigues worn by many U.S. troops operating in Vietnam during the later years of the conflict saw a switch to angled chest pockets, which did make accessing them a little easier. Though this was a move that many now see as a practical and ergonomic one, it wouldn't be seen again on U.S. field uniforms until the 2000s. But as far as modifications go, they did see quite a bit of unique alterations, in part due to the region's high volume of clothiers, tailors, and seamstresses, as well as the evolution of combat, which sometimes required uniquely skilled units. Special forces, be they for covert missions, long-range reconnaissance patrols, cross-border excursions into Laos or Cambodia, or whatever else, often had varying levels of freedom when selecting uniforms, weaponry, and equipment, which often saw a variety of mixing and matching, as well as modifying already existing pieces. These uniforms, sometimes called cross-border uniforms, came in many shapes, sizes, colors, and patterns, though frequently again emphasized arm and shoulder pockets in lieu of lower waist ones. Again, though the practice continued on, it didn't quite take hold with U.S. uniforms, but as the decades moved forward, many other nations started to see the importance of shoulder as well as angled pockets, though often continued to incorporate torso ones too. Additionally, with load bearing and web equipment changing and the slow transfer over to vests for the purposes of both gear and protective armor, the problems of accessibility only increased, while the problem of heat absorption and a lack of breathability leading to retaining sweat was beginning to compound. After the fall of the Soviet Union and the Communist bloc, much of the world's focus quickly shifted to the Middle East and surrounding areas, which came in the form of Iraq and the First Gulf War, as well as the Somali Civil War, both of which led to multinational coalitions forming, leading to forces being sent in. It was also around this time the Raid Mod, as most people know it today, began to take shape. Again, like a majority of instances in the past, these modifications were primarily done by Special Forces units, with perhaps the most well-documented being Delta Force. Seen mostly with U.S. Woodland BDUs and three-color 
Desert DCUs, these modifications again came in all shapes and sizes, but for the most part followed a general theme of moving the lower waist pockets up to the shoulders, adding a level of hook and loop material for name tapes and shoulder sleeve insignia, and often the reorienting of chest pockets, be it tilted at an angle, such as inwards towards the buttoned opening, outwards sometimes towards the sleeve, or, like in this case, just moving them down the torso section slightly. Though we've established from a general perspective where and when this concept originated, where did this specific form begin? that being the raid mod. Well, it's a bit hard to say for certain, but there seems to be two leading suggestions that also relate to the name. The first is rather basic, as it stated that a tailor at Fort Bragg, now named Fort Liberty, home of the U.S. Army's Special Operations Command located in North Carolina, began to offer these modifications, essentially pioneering the refined style to those interested and simply dubbed it raid mod. The second, which is a bit more detailed, is that the styling just sort of caught on using already established elements, which over time gained a level of relative uniformity with the name raid raid being attached to it as the pieces would often be used primarily for just that, raids, which are often quick excursions meant to achieve a specific objective not usually related to capturing or holding areas or fighting enemies in conventional ground-based combat. For the later part of the 20th century onwards, raids such as these frequently occurred in more confined and urban areas and often saw specialty forces equipped with specific webbing and gear, most notably vests and body armor due to the close quarter combat, thus resulting in the overall increased prevalence of these modifications. It's also possible it was a mix of the two, but whatever the case, the name stuck, and as the 90s gave way to the 2000s, their numbers only increased, and with the start of the global war on terror, they would explode in popularity, seeing numerous features and looks eventually in part, inspiring the next generation of U.S. military uniforms. As the wars in both Afghanistan and Iraq waged, the excessive temperatures saw a massive increase in perspiration and heat retention. Added new forms of warfare, often seeing an emphasis on urban and close quarter based operations, leading to the need for an increase in protective body armor, not to mention the recent introduction of molly based gear, aging camouflage patterns shared across all branches, a series of complaints relating to helmets, boots, and other features failing or interfering with duties, and you have yourself a recipe for new uniforms. Now, the military had been aware of many of these issues and for a while had been looking into redeveloping uniforms, which would incorporate new levels of features and technology. This came in the form of a series of uniform and system modernization programs, which ran through the 90s and into the 2000s. Endeavors such as Project Scorpion developed by Cry Associates, now known as Cry Precision, Future Soldier Systems, and Objective Force Warrior, which led into Future Force Warrior, saw a number of concept and experimental systems be developed, and though no single one was adopted in its original form, many elements and features were, with some being seen much sooner than others. The combat shirt was one such example, but more on that shortly. Additionally, it seems all of this work led to a massive wave of uniform reforms and updates, as literally every branch of the U.S. military through the 2000s and into the early 2010s introduced a new style uniform, granted sometimes having to take a few tries to get it right. Each was distinct, utilizing different colors and camouflages. However, most also deviated greatly from the BDU mold, seeing a shift in torso pocket count and orientation along with the addition of shoulder pockets. Though some of these were a bit more extensive than others, they all saw, or eventually would see, many features as seen on a majority of raid mods. But what all of them failed to address was that the fabric making up the torso sections continued to have the drawback of absorbing heat and sweat, especially when worn in hotter climates and more so when vests and gear were worn over them. As a way to help alleviate this problem, many deployed to the Middle East would take advantage of compression style shirts, as they were designed to wick sweat and breathe much better, but again, that only did so much. Once more, as a solution, many started to alter their uniforms to fight this, and again, this was usually seen by members of Special Forces units. Their solution? Cut off the sleeves of their standard field top or whatever else, and simply sew them to short sleeve shirts, giving them the best of both worlds, as they were now able to utilize pockets on the sleeves while also having the lightweight and more breathable fabric of an undershirt. Though this process never really quite got to the same level as regular raid mods, it did seemingly help lead to the eventual creation of the combat. That shirt. As you can see, when looking at prototype shirt designs associated with some of the modern and future soldier initiatives, they have a lot in common. However, it wasn't really the sweat and heat retention caused by an excess of gear and armor problem, nor the idea of a future warrior system that ultimately caused the US military to actively work on a solution, but rather one much more dire. Due to an increase in improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, many were at risk whilst traveling long distances along roads and trails. Exponentially more were the ones assigned to logistical operations such as convoys tasked with transporting goods and materiel essential to the war effort. This led 
to an increased focus on creating flame-resistant army combat uniforms for those at risk. However, the material within them only added to the heat retention and airflow issues. Naturally, this led to complaints about these uniforms and seeing the same problems arise with many forces now also wearing extensive gear and rather large body armor systems, something needed to be done. And so both the US Army and Marine Corps set out to create a new garment that would address these issues. Though both saw levels of work around the same time, the Army had begun its research much earlier due to all those future soldier projects, and as such were the first to unveil their solution, the ACS, or Army Combat Shirt. Announced in May of 2007, the shirt was touted as a flame-resistant long-sleeve shirt, which retains the moisture-wicking capability, breathability, and durability of other components in the ACU. Also has many of its other features, including cargo pockets, infrared identification tabs, and hook-and-loop fasteners for the American flag. Testing of these ran through most of the year, and in September they debuted in a much more formal way, but continued trials for a time more, finally being officially issued in early 2008, seeing two given to each soldier deployed overseas. Meanwhile, around the same time, the Marine Corps announced then began issuing their FROG, or Flame Resistant Organizational Gear, which took a slightly different approach in that in addition to designing a combat shirt, it also saw the creation of various components to protect other areas of the body, which could be swapped out, used with other pieces, or worn in conjunction with one another. As the War on Terror went on, the spread of these combat shirts among the U.S. military began, meaning other nations observed them and followed suit, as did a number of companies which also started to produce their own versions. As the 2010s arrived, numerous coalition countries began fielding their own styles, each of which saw different details and elements with some featuring larger shoulders, quarter zips, collars, padding, pocket orientation, and so on. Of these, many continued to utilize Nomex and other flame retardant material, while others simply focused more on breathability. In regards to the U.S., work would continue on them, seeing improved versions sporting new features and camouflages as branches continued to refine and play around with their field uniforms. This naturally has led to quite a number out there and in a way has created a whole new subcategory of uniform as entire systems were designed and developed around the concept of these shirts, meaning they weren't just a supplementary piece. Additionally, due to their lightweight and cooling elements, some forces around the world started wearing them on their own, whether it was for non-combat reasons, in between missions, promotional or press purposes, and so on, the shirts soon began to take on a life of their own. Two interesting examples of this were when members of SEAL Team 6 wore them during the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound in Pakistan. For weeks and months after, articles about certain members often showed them in the shirts. The second came in September of 2022, when elements of Burkina Faso's army staged a coup against the interim government. Soon after, Captain Ibrahim Traore took control as president and since then has made the shirt something of a style and almost a symbol for his presidency, as he continues to wear a variety of combat shirts for anything and everything, be it day-to-day -day activities, to more formal diplomatic meetings. The combat shirt is a perfect example of the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. Having its roots go as far back as the Second World War, this piece proved that when it comes to military uniforms, often the best elements are spawned out of the needs of those wearing them, and though sometimes things can take a while to implement, usually they'll become incorporated. But hopefully this video was entertaining and informative to those curious about both combat shirts and raid-modified garments. As stated, there are now untold amounts of combat shirts out there, be they officially issued, commercially produced, or custom made. As for raid mod tops, they aren't really seen that often anymore at least on the battlefield. Though many older and newer produced ones, be they from custom shops or sellers, or even those showcasing tutorial videos on how to make them, are, meaning they continue to be readily available. And if you think about it, there's a little bit of them in every current US military field uniform. But on that note, that will about do it for this video. If you enjoyed it and found it educational, perhaps leave a like and subscribe if you haven't yet done so. If not, don't fret, all good. Just be sure to check back real soon for more videos right here on Uniform History.